Hey guys, this is Tamara from F The Track. And this afternoon I wanted to do something a little bit different from the standard kind of content on the page. I um, wanted to do a, an ownership review, a buyer's guide, and a track review all in one video. I thought it would make it a little bit uh, kind of different and something kind of unique basically. So um, basically I'm just going to start from the beginning. I've owned my car. This is a 20, 2010 Lexus ISF. I've owned uh, my car now I believe for 42,000 miles. Um, I've had 19 track days on the cars, or on the car, excuse me. So I've, uh, you know, I've had a decent amount of time basically to kind of feel the platform out and kind of see what it's about basically here. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Is what you know is, is with the owners who are uh, uh, who are planning maybe to go to the track basically, as well as some of the people out there just fans of the car, or maybe somebody who's just thinking about maybe picking up one, which I think is a good idea. Do it. Um, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to start from the beginning. Like I said, I've owned the car for uh, 42,000 miles. I've done 19 track days. Um, in terms of, let's say, let's start from the, from the bad stuff, basically. In terms of issues with the car, the car doesn't have very many, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i give you basically what I've had. Um, most cars are going to have recalls, okay? That's the standard kind of stuff, basically. I've had uh, two recalls with the car, obviously covered by Lexus, no issue. Um, I believe one was a fuel system recall and another one had to do with the uh, cooling system. I don't know exactly what they were, but I can look them up for you and uh, put them in the content section basically here. Um, but no big deal, they were covered by, under warranty. Now, uh, one, I'd say solid issue that I did have that would cost owners money if they didn't have warranty or if they bought a car off warranty. Um, luckily enough, I had warranty on my car basically. Um, I had the uh, Lexus Extra Care, which I bought just to extend the uh, factory warranty through the manufacturer, which I always prefer ideally. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the issue that we're having, and we're actually seeing pop up a little bit more than I'd like to kind of admit, um, it's obviously not everybody, but they're out there, is this valley plate uh, leak that we're finding. So what owners are finding, you know, as the car's age, let's say over 50,000, 60,000 and up, we're starting to find that, you know, you put the cars up on the rack, you lift them up, and there's coolants, basically, which is bright pink and dry, uh, but very, very easy to spot, luckily, basically. Um, uh, you're going to find leaking from the base of the engine, or uh, excuse me, it's from the valley plate leaking down to the base, so it's pretty easy to spot. Now, the fix um, is either going to be covered under warranty, or if you're a handy kind of guy, you might want to be able to, you know, you can do it yourself. Um, I had my uh, service plan take care of it for me, but I have heard uh, through the grapevine and some of the forums basically for the uh, the guys who didn't have it covered under warranty, we're talking like two grand, um, maybe even a little bit more. Some people have actually managed to have Lexus kind of go in with them and split the cost with them, which is kind of cool if you can get that done. Depends on how far over your, your factory warranty is, uh, is, is basically over, gonna, over the standard factory 50, I think, or 60, I believe it, I believe it is. Now, um, in terms of servicing the ISF, I always do my servicing at the dealership, you know, to each his own. Some guys are a little bit more handy, they have a little bit more time. Um, I'm not one of those guys, I'm, I'm the opposite basically. I've got uh, less time and maybe more, you know, m more funds to take care of that stuff because I don't have the confidence to do it and I don't have the time to even learn to do it. So I just pay somebody to take care of it. So when I take my car to the Lexus dealership locally, um, and I, you know the price is obviously gonna vary, my standard, let's say, oil change, which is gonna run me every, uh, you know, I do mine every 5,000 miles, which which is, you know, as directed by Lexus. Um, it runs me generally, let's say, 100 and, I think it's 140 bucks, I wanna say. Um, maybe even a little bit more, it just depends basically. But what I do like is I drop the car off, oil change gets done and then when you complain about the price generally what they're going to say to you basically is the reason we charge so much is because we don't charge for oil change we charge for service so <laughs> all right fine they do their checks um that kind of a thing basically but uh, anyways runs about anywhere let's say realistic from 140 to 170 uh depending on your lexus dealership that's for the every 5,000 miles now you can obviously take it to uh, you know a smaller shop maybe do it yourself that kind of thing save quite a bit of money the uh, 30,000 mile services, uh, at least in my experience, are running about 500 bucks. Um, and then the big 60, which is the massive one that they do everything on, that ran me, I believe it was 1075, so close to $1,100 to have that uh, done. Um, I know some people, I mean, in the bigger cities and they're commuting with these cars, they might actually care about gas mileage. I really don't give a damn. But for those uh, who do care, I'm, uh, I drive my car pretty aggressively uh, and I do city and uh, and highway mixed mostly highway though but but I live in an urban area 
excuse me, kind of on the edge of the, uh, the city, basically, not so much urban. But we have a lot of open highways here, so I tend to do a lot more, uh, let's call it higher speed, right? Let's say 68. Uh, as opposed to 65 basically so I, I get close to maybe 15 miles to the gallon it's not it's not that great um, it's not what I would you know it's nothing I complain about personally um, the car is you know pushing over 400 horsepower it's a 5 liter V8 um, and you know if you're shooting for gas mileage man buy a 350 to be honest I'm just just for me to you just my own opinion I don't want to insult anybody out there but uh, you know, if you're looking for a car that's going to get 22 miles a gallon, I know it is possible in this thing. I've heard people on the forums mention that kind of stuff. I have no, I have no fucking clue how anybody gets 22 miles to the gallon, unless in the, unless they're just straight up open highway for you know an hour straight, and you're just you're either on the phone or you're listening to music constantly. You don't give a shit about really driving the car um, or pushing it, basically. So again, to each his own. Um, in terms of the guys out there who are thinking about maybe buying an ISF, so this is the, this is the buyer's guide section of the review I wanted to do for you guys. Um, these cars are pretty rare. Uh, they obviously didn't sell, you know, as, as massively well as the M3s basically here, which I think makes them, in my opinion, a little bit more special. That's just one of the things that makes the car a little bit, uh, like a little bit more special, basically, than the standard, you know, Euro, uh, you know, super sedans or super sedans that you see out there, especially the the older ones. Um, there's only 5,118 Lexus ISFs uh, sold in the United States, so again, very, very rare. Uh, a big, big chunk of those cars are going to be the first two years, especially the 08s, but the 08s and 09s are the most common years, um, or the bigger numbers sold, basically, the bigger chunk of the of the 5100 and change, basically, that's sold out there. Um, they're great cars, very, very strong motors, reliable cars, great suspensions, great handling, um, but like any other first generation, uh, you know, first couple of model year cars, they do have their... Uh, you know, we'll call them the teething issues, basically, kind of those initial issue uh, things that come out, and certain things also dynamically, or certain things about the car that the owners might not like, it gets back to Lexus and they do some tweaks. Um, so, let's start with those, basically. The 08s and 09s, again, being the more common or the bigger chunk of the uh, ISF population out there, they do have, uh, we'll call them well-known water pump issues, basically, they or water pump leaks, so they do tend to leak. Um, you're gonna find basically when you when you take uh, the hood up or lift the hood up basically put a flashlight straight down in it right in the front you're gonna see the pink fluid leaking down it's pretty uh, pretty easy thankfully like this uses a slight fluorescent pink cool it so very easy to catch um, the other thing that is pretty common with the uh, early uh, earlier model years are gonna be the uh, melting dash issues basically some of them in some of the hot states and some cars um, with some some of the owners of findings at the dash and the top of the door panels actually even even the side of the door panels basically starts to get kind of tacky and it starts to actually look like it's starting to melt like it starts to degrade basically so it looks like shit feels like shit um, so something to watch out for basically some of the cars were taken care of under warranty it doesn't seem like Lexus is doing much for them now basically afterwards so um, if you're going to look for, again, they're going to be the more common ones, and they're going to also be, obviously, because they're older, they're going to be a little bit easier to get into in terms of pricing, but they're going to have, you know, that's one thing to look out for. Just always check the door panels, check the top of the dash to look for any melting, basically. <clears throat> also, in terms of handling, it's subtle, and especially if you're not going to be on the track, basically, but the earlier model years didn't have a limited slip differential, so I... Um, I don't know. I, I I do think it's an issue. Personally, I bought this car after owning a um, an LS 460 for three and a half years, specifically to go to the track. So I didn't want to I didn't want to get one of the model years that didn't have basically. Let's put it this way: the the appropriate track suspension. So I ended up doing the uh, the 2010 in terms of my budgeting, and then also I could get a good uh, I could get basically a good model year that had a limited slip differential. So the 2010s were the years where they got the they got upgraded limited slip. You also had some changes to the infotainment, which is kind of nice. You can stream your music and that kind of a thing. Um, I kind of like that. I don't have to mess with my iPod anymore. Basically, everything's right from my phone and there's no wires, basically. Um, now, the 2011 probably had the most significant year changes. Um, basically, with 2011, you got upgraded headlights. Um, they changed the dash out, um, kind of the, the, the outlay, basically, or the, the, the way everything looks. You've got, instead of a attack on the right, and then a speedometer on the left, it's kind of more, I don't know, sports car-like, basically, we'll call it a Porsche-like, where you just have this huge center-mounted tack. 
then you've got a digital uh, readout for the speed as well as a really small uh, speedometer. I personally was shopping when I bought mine for the 11s and the 10s. I didn't like that at all. Um, I want to see how fast I'm going, basically a little easier than that. So I was kind of turned off by that. Um, also, I live in the hills. The 2010s have the uh, directional headlights. The 2011s uh, lost the directional headlights, but then they got the cool, you know, front end, more modern looking uh, Nike light is what they're calling them basically here. Um, again, up to you. With me, I found the 2010s were a little bit cheaper. It had the limited slip and it didn't have, for me, the funky dash. So I didn't want to do that. Um, and it worked out in the end. But the 2011s also do have some significant suspension modifications. I mean, we're not talking a revolution, but they did try and make it a little bit more uh, refined. Um, I think because most of the owners of the 20, uh, 28, uh, 2008, excuse me, 2009, 2010 cars, um, including every reviewer <laughs> who's ever read the, uh, reviewed the car, excuse me, is always complaining about the super harsh ride. And yes, the car does ride a bit harsh, basically, um, especially compared to an M3. They're both going to be harsh. This one, it feels like a little bit bouncier. It's, uh, it just feels, um, I'm not going to say overly damped, but heavily damped, basically. So if you live in, a, in an area that's got bad roads or some pretty shitty surfaces to drive on, you know, you're not, you're, you might like it, your girlfriend or mom's not going to like it, basically, or your, uh, your dad probably like it, I mean, if you guys are out there running around having some fun and, uh, and messing around on the car. But again, yeah, it is a big complaint. So I find that, that a lot of the, the suspension tweaks, when you really look into them, it was supposed to be for more confidence and inspiration basically on the track. I find that the, uh, the, the, or what I'm reading basically online, and again, we'll have to take that with a grain of salt, is that the, uh, the shocks are 10 to 20% uh, stiffer depending on the, the valving the speed, um, as well as the spring rate coming down 5%. So I'm not 100% on that information, but that's what I'm finding from an Edmonds article. Um, take it with a grain of salt, basically. So they did make some su the suspension modifications in 2011, though. Um, I think, though, between the lightning lap, the car and driver lightning lap uh, track times, basically, between the uh, 2008 and the 2011 ISFs, there's a solid four-second lap time difference uh, when car and driver took them out and beat the hell out of them, basically, uh, which is extremely significant, especially if you drive on the track. Now, I don't think, personally, and I'm not just saying this because I drive a 2010, I still think a majority of that improvement on the track is not the suspension modifications. I think most of that uh, was for compliance and just ride comfort. Um, I think the steering, the, in 2011 they did also do a steering ECU modification. Um, that could be 2012, I'm not 100% sure, but I know they did that one of those two years. That's also just to kind of stiffen up the, the steering a bit. The steering on the ISF, if you have one of the, the earlier model years, there's a slight kind of, we'll call it maybe three quarters of an inch kind of dead center. Um, slight, where you just feel like you want it a little bit tighter right off center, basically. So apparently they addressed that with the newer steering ECU. So, I mean, if you had the money to kind of do the 11 or the 10 and you want all the bells and whistles and every little modern tweak, the 11 is always going to be the best, especially if you don't mind the dash layout. A lot of guys actually like it. I personally didn't want it <laughs> personally, but again, to each his own. But the, um, the 11 is a slightly more fine-tuned basically here. Now in the uh, 2012 model year, yeah, the main real difference basically out there, you guys, just slightly wider wheels. Um, Lexus went really narrow on these on these uh, cars. I can't believe we're, you know, we're pushing a, I believe it's 3,680 pound, you know, sedan basically, and they're running two 225s in the front, 255s in the rear. That's, that's kind of ridiculous, man. Um, so it brings us back to another issue with the car uh, that, that you will feel right out of the box, especially when you pick up the car and you want to go out and fuck around with it a little bit. Um, you're going to absolutely run into some solid, solid understeer, especially at the limit. Um, I, it was weird. I went from an LS460 uh, on 22-inch wheels, but I was running a two, 255 in the front and 295 in the back, and I was on Michelin Super Sports. <laughs> I can't believe I spent two grand on tires. Anyways, uh, so the car still stuck. Obviously, for a car that big, it would roll like a pig or in a boat, but it still stuck. So it was funny. One night, you know, right after I picked up the ISF, I went out to, to drive it. I think I went to go drop somebody off at the airport, and I'm taking the on-ramp like crazy and just pushing it. And the fucking thing is starting to understeer. I literally went from the right lane to the left lane. I mean, I left a little, uh, I left that corner a little upset at the car, to be honest. I was kind of shocked. I'm like, how the fuck did my LS460 handle this turn better than the ISF would? That's kind of strange. Now, again, there's no roll and everything feels super tight and direct, but the front tires are starting to let go. So, anyways, yeah, they, 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 again, another common mod with this car is just upgrading to a 245 in the front of 275 in the back. You can't do that. 
with the uh, with even the earlier model years. Anyway, so again, the 2012 got a wider wheels. Okay, now how much wider? It's only half an inch, but that half an inch opens up kind of different sizes slightly for those owners. So. And if you do have a 2012 and you get the wider wheels, which are in slightly higher demand for some of the owners who want the uh, the pure OEM look, basically, you can pick one of those up. Have the slightly wider wheels, you know. And again, in terms of the styling, you know, it's all subjective. Um, but they come with the wider wheels, so you can upgrade to I think a 255, um, and I want to say a 285 probably in the back, something like that safely. I personally don't like the upsizing on the stock wheels. It it didn't feel good to me at all. Um, feels very wishy-washy. Uh, to each his own though. I like kind of the direct feeling of the stocker fit or something. Just that slight stretch, you know what I mean? You don't want that beefy, that's sorry, a beefy sidewall. You don't want the thing sticking off to the side. Anyways, to each his own, you can feel that out. There's lots of stuff on Club Lexus actually, uh, which is an excellent form. If you guys are looking to buy an ISF or if you're a fan of the ISF and don't know much about it, basically that's a great place to find out uh, information is the ISF forum on Club Lexus. Um, now things to watch for, in terms of just owning the car basically um, or if you're gonna pick one up and you're again you're shopping for it again some more more in terms of the buyer guide basically the valley plate leak we've mentioned that before a main thing with the second generation is uh, is cars and it is it is kind of a nuisance for owners basically but thank god it is resolvable without spending too much money basically is the inner tire wear that comes with the second generation is and we're talking 250 350 isf it doesn't make a difference they all do it um, I would assume that the ISF might be a little bit worse because the motor's so big and it's heavier, basically. Um, but anyways, it has what we call a dynamic toe problem. So when you hit the brakes, the front tires toe in, um, and then the, the, you, get you get tire wear, basically. Everything tends to eat up the, uh, the inner tire wall. Um, it actually might be toe out if it's going to be the inner tire wall. So I'm not sure, <laughs> but there's a there's a toe issue. Um, anyways, the, t the tires basically don't remain straight under under load when you're braking heavily or even just mildly. Tires deflect. You get inner tire wear. The tires go really quickly and it pisses owners off, especially when you own a car like this. Um, and you put nice tires on it. That's kind of upsetting. You know, these tires add up basically, um, and it gets annoying, especially when you're getting like let's say a third or less of the tire life of the you know the tires. So um, thankfully, uh, the aftermarket does supply um, upper control arm bushings or control arm bushings for the ISF 350, and I believe the 250 as well um, that are stiffer. It's a higher uh, durometer reading basically. So it, once you hit the brakes, you don't get that tire deflection. Everything stays straight and you basically don't wear out the tires so that's something to watch out for so you might want to look on when you if you get a chance look into the car something a lot of owners are starting to address the issue now that the aftermarket is is supplying parts for that kind of stuff or, or bushings so you might want to lift the thing up or just look underneath it basically see if the uh, the bushings on uh, right behind the front tires have been replaced or if they look you know aftermarket they might be orange or blue or purple that's what the aftermarket companies are supplying right now um, another common issue with this car engine ticking okay now the, these cars do come with uh, direct injection as well as port injection I believe but the uh, the direct injection is it's a bitch it's loud I've had a I've had a GS350 in the past uh, I have an, an LS460 before the ISF and now the ISF every single one of them has this really annoying ticking especially if you pull up next to a wall um, that kind of a thing especially let's say let's say you're headed out and you're trying to get something to eat you go to a drive through it's, uh, it's hilarious. You pull right next to the wall and you're like, what the fuck? It's just like tick, 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 tick. In the end, it's normal, okay? Um, it comes with a direct injection. Now, a secondary portion of that, I think, is just the ISF cut. The ISF has like a design, call it quirk. It's not an issue. They just make that ticking noise. It's kind of annoying, but they do it. We've had guys do, you know, the engine, the, the valve inspections and the, you know, readjustments and that kind of stuff you fuck with the octane it doesn't make a difference they just tick so don't lose your mind if you find one that's ticking it's not the uh it's not the end of the world basically here um now the engine ticking another portion of that too is now we're finding as some of the cars are aging that some of the cars are having uh, um the uh the header issues basically the oem headers are starting to crack um, right at the base of the flange so what the owners are finding is when they start the car up in the morning, especially when the car is real cold, you get this really loud ticking for probably about a minute, maybe 30 seconds, and then it just kind of slowly just dissipates and goes away. It fades. That's it. Um, so you want to watch for that, especially if you're looking for an 08, 09, or even 2010 that's higher mileage, whatever it is. If it's higher mileage, you need to watch for that because that would be a pain in the ass, and that is an expensive fix to have that repaired. 
So again, something to watch for you guys. Um, the uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up basically is going to be the belt slip noise, and I, de I definitely have this issue. What uh, what a lot of owners are finding again, not everybody, but again, something to watch for. When you're on the test drive, don't pussyfoot. You know, beat the thing up feel it out a little bit, run it to red line. So what a lot of uh, owners are finding, including myself, and it doesn't look like there's a solid fix or an easier fix, is we're getting a uh, loud belt slip noise at red line. Okay, so I mean, real simple, put the tech in the, in the car next to you, put the thing in first gear, hit sport mode, and just floor it. Once it gets to five, 6,000, just shift it basically, it'll get a loud belt slip noise. It's not your transmission blowing, it's nothing like that basically, which it, it tripped me the hell out when I first heard mine. I, it was right after I bought it too, and I was freaking out. But in the end, it seems like it's 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 uh, it's a uh, one of the more th common issues with the car basically. And um, what we're finding is a lot of guys, including myself, have replaced the uh, the drive pulley and the the, the drive belt uh, to no avail. Not to say no avail initially. It does work initially to get rid of the noise, but afterward, uh, with, with for me, it took maybe six to eight weeks. It just came back. Now we have had another owner that I've spoken to um, who had his uh, AC compressor blow up on the track day and uh, when it went out and they went ahead and replaced it, it ended up getting rid of the noise for him. So I mentioned to my, uh, and I'm working with Lexus right now to try and get mine addressed, but I've mentioned to them that I replaced, because the tech one I spoke to him, excuse me, mentioned that uh, it's either the drive belt and pulley or it's the AC. Now, I told him, well, I just replaced the drive belt and the pulley uh, like two years ago and the noise came back within six, seven weeks. Um, so, uh, you know, that kind of, I don't know necessarily that kind of takes it off the table, but, you know, that kind of points maybe towards the AC. So next time I take it in, I'm going to try and mention that to them, basically see if we can get that addressed. But in my opinion, you guys, it's pointing towards the AC compressor. So if you have that issue, you know what I mean? The belt, obviously, and the pulley is cheap as hell, but you might need to replace the belt the, or the AC if it starts to bother you. It doesn't affect performance. It doesn't affect track driving. It doesn't attract, uh, affect uh, drivability or safety or anything like that. It's just a loud freaking belt noise. Some of the guys have <laughs> mentioned on the forum that they thought it was actually the rear tire slipping. And I, don't flatter yourselves, you guys. It's the belt, man. It sounds like it's from the front. It's not from the back. So in the end, if you want to get that addressed, it's probably the AC, in my opinion. And I've done probably a little bit more homework into this than most people. And I've nagged my service advisor probably than most people would probably go after him for this. Um, I have mentioned the understeer, and again, okay, we've mentioned that, and people upsize into the 245, uh, 35, that's something you might want to look into, or if you're looking for an ISF, you might find that when you look at them, uh, they already have them on there, so if, if, you, if it's a 225, I believe 4019, that's standard, if you're looking at a 245, 35, then you're, you've, you've had the owner previous to you, who's already done the upgrading, basically, which is kind of cool. Um, now, in terms on uh, in terms of ownership of the car, my own personal opinion on ownership, I love this car, you guys. I've had this car now for three years. Um, I tend to get bored uh, after owning my cars for about two or three years, even after modding them. Excuse me. So, I fall in love with them, but you know, not forever, basically. Now, this is the only car I've ever had in my life where I've owned over three years and I just, I'm not thinking about owning it. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> getting rid of it. There's nothing else on the market right now that I'd rather own than this car. Um, I go look at some of the uh, the F80 M3s, beautiful cars, they fly, great tunability. Um, I don't like the reliability, personally, you guys. It's just, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's a personal thing. I just, I don't trust BMWs. Um, they are great cars, great to drive, but again, some cars are great to own and some cars are great to drive. Um, and you know, if you do your practice on the track, you guys, with an ISF, I've taken down an F80 uh, M3 that was tuned even by good speed. And I had, uh, I don't say no issue taking them down, but I took them down. So do your homework on the track. You guys can keep up with whoever the hell you want to keep up, you guys. Um, but anyways, great car, reliable car. Um, and I find now with the with all the modern cars now going, you guys, towards the, uh, you know, all the forced induction stuff now, everything's going either turbo, majority is turbo. You might find some of the, you know, the odd ones are going supercharged, basically. But everything's going forced induction, so we're losing a lot of the sound. We're losing cylinders, we're losing sound. Um, and I feel like that, that makes the car lose a little driving character. It doesn't make the car as fun as some of the, uh, you know, normally aspirated, loud-ass, you know, big V8s, basically, that make it a lot more fun to kind of get on the pedal, basically. It's that noise that adds character. Again, I mean, you get on it, and it sounds like you're getting on it. So it, it makes it, in my opinion, it adds the car, it adds some character to the car, it makes the car more fun to drive. Um, 
it announces the car a little bit more. And to be honest, now that, like I said, cars are going uh, forced induction and mostly turbo, you're gonna find most of these cars are gonna sound kind of weak, a little bit lame basically when they're taken off. Um, the, uh, my personal ISF is, uh, is fitted with a Josie exhaust, so it has a very nice, solid tone to it basically. It sounds great, especially when you get on it. Um, and the other beautiful thing about the ISF is it doesn't really take a lot of mods to make this car great. I've done 19 track days, you guys, which is more than the majority of owners out there. Um, on stock suspension, effectively minus, um, I do have the F-Sport rear sway bar to get rid of the understeer that I discussed with you guys before. And I do have the uh, upper control arm bushings from uh, from RR Racing, basically, which helped to get rid of some of the uh, um, some of that, that deflection of the tires that kills some of the inner tire wear. And I feel like it absolutely helps tighten up the steering, in my opinion, a little bit. Um, but the car, again, not very modified. It has an exhaust, <laughs> a rear sway bar that's three millimeters wider than stock, and then I have the uh, stiffer uh, front bushings. So that's pretty much it, you guys. And then I have the uh, the cars fitted with um, HRE uh, FF15 wheels with the uh, with a much wider footprint. I went with a 255 35 in the front, which is what Lexus puts in the back stock, and then I went with a huge 295 in the back. Um, for again the best the, the best grip on track now my car does roll on track a little bit basically maybe a little bit more than I'd like to when I have a passenger but for the most part man it's really well rounded the car handles um, if you have good tires on it the car is very neutral at the limit even with the sway bar um, uh, I can get a little bit of understeer very little um, and then basically as the rear tires go because they do wear out much faster than the front You do tend to, fi uh, to find that the car as the tires wear kind of leans or kind of shifts towards um, uh, Away from more of a neutral slight understeer, which is what you want to uh, a little bit more of an oversteer on cor corner exit Which is kind of fun <laughs> Especially if you got with the good snap uh, You got the good snap uh, oversteer correction basically so the main issue um, uh, for me, stock out of the box is just the redonkulous freaking uh, understeer, and I hate that. I cannot believe they set this thing up to go up with the M3 and then it had understeer like that, and no li limited slip for 08 and 09. That's it's it, it's just it's a, it's a handicap. I mean, come on, you guys, and 225s in the front, it's like bicycle tires, man. I mean, a Honda Civics or something like that run that. It's it's uh, it's odd. <laughs> um, yeah, I do love the car. My car does have some mild cosmetic uh, modifications. I do have a Tom's, uh, an authentic Tom's body kit. Again, some mild stuff, you guys, just to kind of give it a little bit of a flair. I'm more of a track guy than I am a cosmetics guy. Um, but I did want to uh, just kind of jazz the car up with the wheels. And I always tell people the wheels make the car kind of... So to conclude, you guys, um, after three years of ownership of the Lexus ISF, and like I said, a good 40, I think 42,000 miles, 19 track days, my main conclusion basically that is, is that basically this is an amazing super sedan. You have to remember too that the, uh, look at the big picture basically. And again, I know the Lexus guys always like, we always harp on reliability and that kind of a thing, but reliability, is, the performance is there. The reliability is what makes the ownership experience a little bit more, I don't know, in my opinion, a little bit more satisfying. Um, because I don't have to always go to the bank or to the uh, way well, to the bank to take it to take the money to the dealership and pay the bastards uh, constantly to fix something in the car. Servicing the the car is one thing, and, and as, as an owner, you know, I understand it is what it is, and that's what you need to do to keep the car running, especially when you drive the car like I do. I drive it a little bit more aggressive than most. It's not a, just a commuter car, this is like kind of a track toy as well as a you know, a daily driver, basically. So, um, in terms of the big picture, in my opinion, you can't beat it. Um, Personal preference, basically, of course, is going to dictate you know a lot of taste, and I understand too, you guys, that, that uh, you know once you get into the, you know this this kind of like you know more powerful super sedan kind of thing, or you know you wanna you wanna have the bragging rights, and I understand that basically, but I think some guys are sitting there splitting hairs. And they're doing the uh, the bench the bench racing uh, racing thing basically. We're sitting going, well, this one's two tenths faster than that, and this one, and I bet you this one is that. That's all bullshit. Take it to the track, learn how to drive the car. The car is set up very very well from factory, you guys. Um, like I'd mentioned before, I mean, I've got some very very mild mods. You know, upper control arm bushings. I've got a rear sway bar that's three millimeters <laughs> wider than standard, so nothing super significant. Um, and then I've got the you know the tie wheels and tires basically. And I did go with a much wider footprint as I discussed before the 255 in the front 295 in the back um, other than other than honestly the wheel fitment I was pretty much the only mod that I did that that was relatively you know pricey basically um, 
other than that, like in terms of performance, I did do a cosmetic mod where I did the uh, the Tom's kit, basically a carbon fiber aero kit, which was also a little expensive, but uh, you know, find the one thing cosmetic, basically one thing. Um, but like I said, all in all, you guys, the car is an amazing car. Um, if you can pick up, uh, you know, used ISF, you can afford to do that, and that's what you want to do. Try and shoot, you know, the, the later the better, basically. But definitely, if you can maybe skirt past the 08s and 09s, it might be better in terms of, you know, reliability. If you're going to buy an older car that doesn't have a warranty, because you might be looking at some water pump issues if it hasn't had, you know, the water pump replaced. Um, and then also, again, as I mentioned before, always watch for those... Um, uh, dash and, and door molding issues basically any kind of melting or anything like that but um, in terms of uh, in terms of track driving you guys like I said the car out of the box does understeer some very very easy mods to get that address basically including it's a hundred and forty dollar F Sport sway bar I mean that's nothing uh, nothing that's gonna break the bank for most people basically um, it is a pretty easy thing to put on as well from what I understand some people can do it just sitting there when the car is parked on the ground you don't even have to lift it up um, but yeah, like I said, it's a great used car. It can make a good, you know, family car. Like I said, I've got the baby seats behind me. Um, it's a, it's a pretty stout uh, track car. And it's a, to be honest, and in all honesty, as long as you're not on the worst roads in the country, it's a pretty solid luxury car as well. You know, I, I take it to the track. I beat the hell out of it. Um, you're running, you know, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with, you know, Porsches and Corvettes, Mustangs, that kind of thing. And then literally, you just put your track chair in the trunk turn on your air conditioning throw some beats on some music and you're cruising home with the air conditioning on the car is silent there's no shaking there's no vibration there's nothing Lexus definitely did their homework with this car you guys because they had to it was the first F car um, and obviously when you're a, when you're a luxury car maker and you make these you know really soft you know not very thrilling cars basically but they're good luxury cars and all of a sudden you're telling everybody yeah I'm gonna come out with something that's gonna compete with the M3 Everybody, you know they know everybody's gonna start laughing at you basically everybody had their doubts so I feel like Lexus did their homework they really went the extra step with this thing in terms of development now it's not its own complete independent chassis and that kind of thing they have to kind of work you know with the 2IS um, you know platform they had but they were managed to kind of beef it up brace it up basically throw the big motor in it um, subjectively in terms of looks I love the way the car looks um, I love the bulging hood the big fenders basically it makes the car look a lot more muscular basically masculine in my opinion um, I don't mind the, the rear tips exhaust tips that everybody seems to make such a big deal about you guys the um, those rear fake tips are not fake tips they're actually diffusers they relieve uh, pressure in the bumper area at very high speed the bumper is basically creating like a rake effect as you're going through the air at very high speed so it's kind of nice to open it up relieve some of that pressure and I think personally I like the way it looks it's like a signature kind of design element for the uh, for the F cars um, whatever some people you know let's say Jeremy Clarkson will harp on something and then everybody just takes it and runs with it basically and that's uh, <laughs> that's basically it I like it I don't mind it some guys uh, will modify their tips on the uh, the exhaust you can take out the the uh, the fake diffusers um, and throw in uh, you know you can extend your own tips basically or just you know have new mufflers thrown on but um, like I said all in all you guys it's a great car um, I will admit though because uh, we are finding that the uh, the, the, the the ISF is getting a pretty solid, uh, I'm going to say a cult following, but it is picking up a solid following. It's got a good solid, normally aspirated V8. Uh, it's got some good mods. It's, it's not an expensive car to own relative to some of its competition, basically. Um, and it looks good. Um, so what we're finding now is some of the prices are actually going up. Um, I've seen... I've seen, let's say, uh, some of the members on F the Track who are, uh, who are selling their cars right now, some of them are selling their cars and offering and even getting uh, uh, and, and getting uh, bites, basically, at six grand over sticker. I mean, that's uh, not sticker, over, uh, excuse me, blue book, which is pretty significant. So if you do have an ISF and you're watching this video, you guys, and you're planning to sell yours, <laughs> you might want to hold on to it for a little bit. I think I think numbers, I'm going to say going to go up, and I definitely think they're not going to go down as quickly as some of the, uh, you know, the standard Lexus models are, basically, here. Um, the uh, uh, like I said, six seven grand over Blue Book, um, and they're getting them, especially with all the mods. A lot of the owners do have some nice mods on these cars, um, and they do them well. Um, and it's and I'm not going to say it's becoming like the NSX, but I mean basically, let's say there's 5,118 ISFs. There's only not, there's 9,500 Acura NSXs. Now, if any of you guys are uh, I don't know if you follow any of that kind of stuff in terms of the market of those cars or or some of the older JDM stuff basically those cars are holding their value like crazy I mean those things are going 95 grand brand new they'll be like 23 years old and they're still fetching like 60 grand 50 grand that kind of thing depending on their mods and their, their condition 
um, but they're holding their value like crazy. Um, I did a photo shoot for HRE Wheels, and the uh, the photographer had a really nice lowered NSX. Just in the like two hours that we were doing the photo shoot, we had three people pull up and ask to, to, to buy the car. And when he told them the price, they were like, what the hell are you talking about? He told them, go, go find another one. So I think what the uh, the ISF is going to become over the years, basically, is going to become you know fewer and further between. Um, and then, as, as like I said, as most of the cars are going normally aspirated, um, you know, and you've got those V6s that don't sound very well. This is, you know, in terms of used car that's reliable, something you don't need to worry about. It's a great value. It sounds great. It's got a lot of character. And like I said, it's not going to leave you at the dealership scratching your head and then holding your ass too because they got you. So it, it's just, it's a great, great, great car, you guys. If you can find one, you might want to pick one up. Um, you guys who have them, <laughs> if you, uh, if you, if you don't need to get rid of them, hold on to them, man. I think these things are going to hold their value for a little bit. Um, like I said, just with the trends of the new cars, it's the first F car. Um, and like I said, it's a great, reliable, powerful used car that you can track, that you can throw kids in, and that if you, uh, if you, if you even run a business and you gotta run around with clients, you can put clients in the car too. So very, very nice car. I hope you guys enjoyed my uh, first uh, F the track vlog. I'm sorry if, uh, if it didn't come out as smooth as I'd like, basically, and I, do, I don't know why the camera's, I know this thing's gonna segment this video into pieces. So I apologize for that basically here, but thanks for following the page you guys. We're almost at 10,000 followers on the page. We're doing really, really well. I'm very excited about that. We got lots of good content for you guys. Um, I'm still uh, booking content on the page literally six months out. Every day I book uh, you know, some posts and usually about six months out. And I do kind of fill, throw some filler and some good stuff in between. I'm trying to change the content uh, uh, Rather than just pictures and videos and interviews, that kind of stuff, or videos of the cars going around corners, we're going to do some more vlogs and more track vlogs and that kind of a thing. So I hope you guys follow and enjoy, and uh, F the track.